You're listening to Penguin Classics On Air. This program is brought to you by Penguin Books, publisher of Songs for the Missing. Beloved novelist Stuart Onan returns to the theme of working-class people and their wrenching concerns in this suspenseful tale of an Ohio community's effort to locate a missing girl. An intimate account of what happens behind the headlines, Songs for the Missing, now available from Penguin Books. Welcome back to Penguin Classics On Air. Every good book begins with a good first page. Now Penguin Classics is happy to bring you First Pages with Stephen Morrison, Penguin's editor-in-chief and associate publisher. Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton's first book, Who Would Have Thought It?, tells the story of Lola, a young orphaned Mexican girl raised in a small town in New England. But Ruiz de Burton's life doesn't parallel Lola's. Ruiz de Burton married an American soldier, settled outside of San Diego, and did not begin writing until later in life. However, her unique experience as both a Mexican woman and an American wife allowed her to offer up a stunning portrayal of clashing cultures in Civil War America. Who would have thought it is this week's installment of First Pages. Chapter 1, The Arrival What would the good and proper people of this world do if there were no rogues in it? No social delinquents. The good and proper, I fear, would perish of sheer inanity, of hypochondriac lassitude, or to say the least, would grow very dull for want of convenient whetstones to sharpen their wits. Rogues are useful. So saying, the Reverend Mr. Hackwell scrambled up the steep side of a crazy buggy, which was tilting ominously under the pressure of the Reverend Mr. Hammerhard's weight, and sat by him. Then the Reverend Hackwell spread over the long legs of his friend Hammerhard a well-worn buffalo robe and tucked the other end carefully under his own graceful limbs, as if his wise aphorism upon rogues had suggested to him the great necessity of taking good care of himself and friend, all for the sake of the good and dull of this world. May I inquire whether present company suggested the philosophical query and highly moral aphorism? And if so, whether I am to be classed with the dull good or the useful whetstones, asked Mr. Hammerhard the Reverend. Mr. Hackwell smiled a smile which seemed to say, Ah, well, my boy, you know full well where we ought to be classed. But he answered, I was thinking of Dr. Norval. Of Dr. Norval? And in what category? In that of a whetstone, of course. Mr. Hammerhard looked at his friend and waited for him to explain his abstruse theory more clearly. I was thinking, Mr. Hackwell continued, How in default of real rogues, there being none such in our community, eh, Ham? (laughs) Ha-hum. Our good and proper people have made a temporary whetstone of Dr. Norval's back. Which fact goes to prove that a social delinquent, real or supposed, is a necessity to good people. As for the charity of the thing, why should people who have all the virtues care to have charity? An excellent text for next Sunday, said Mr. Hammerhard, laughing. Mr. Hackwell joined in the laugh, and with a series of pulls and jerks to the reins, he began to turn slowly the big head of a yellow horse of a gothic build and slow motion in the direction of the railroad depot, for the two divines were going to meet Dr. Norval, who was expected to arrive from California in the 6 p.m. train from New York that evening. The yellow beast hung down his big head, put out his tongue, shut tight his left eye, and started looking intently at the road with the right eye open wide, as if he had been in the habit of wearing an eyeglass, which he had just dropped as he started. E, 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 went the crazy buggy, as if following the big-headed beast just to laugh at him, but in reality only squeaking for want of oiling and from great old age. Confound the brute, he squints and lolls his tongue out worse than ever, exclaimed Mr. Hackwell, and the rickety vehicle fairly laughs at us, hear it? E, e, creaked the buggy very opportunely. Look here, Ham. It is your turn to grease the wheels now. I greased them last time, added Hackwell. Greasing the wheels won't prevent the crazy, dilapidated concern from squeaking and going to pieces any more than your sermons prevent some members of your congregation from gossiping and going to the devil, answered Mr. Hammerhard sententiously. I wish I could send them there in this wagon. All all the palsied beasts and the rotten wagon, the penurious Yankees that won't give us a decent conveyance, said Mr. Hackwell. All the rich people of our town belong to your congregation, all the rich and the good. Make them shell out, Hack. You are the fashion, Hammerhart observed. Yes, that is the reason I drive this fashionable turnout. No, they won't give except it is squeezed out of them. They are so good, you know. My only hope is in Dr. Norval. Because he is a whetstone, asked Ham. Exactly. 
because he is the only man who don't pretend to be a saint, because he is the only one in this village who has a soul, but makes no parade of the trouble it gives him to save it. His virtuous wife and Mrs. Cackle will save his soul for him. You would think so if you heard Mrs. Cackle's conversation today with my wife. The old lady gave us a hash of it, well-spiced. We went over the vast field of Mrs. Norval's virtues and the vaster one of the doctor's errors, all of which have their root in the doctor's most unnatural liking for foreigners. That liking was the cause of the doctor sending his only son Julian to be educated in Europe, as if the best schools on earth were not in New England, and heaven knows what might have become of Julian if his heroic mother had not sent for him. He might have been a Roman Catholic for all we know. That liking was also the cause of the doctor sending Isaac to be a good-for-nothing clerk in sinful Washington among foreigners when he could have remained in virtuous New England to be a useful farmer. And finally, impelled by that liking, the doctor betook himself to California, which is yet full of natives. And as a just retribution for such perverse liking, the doctor was well-nigh roasted by the natives, said the old lady. Whereupon, in belief of truth, I said, Not by the natives, madam. The people called the natives are mostly of Spanish descent and are not cannibals. The wild Indians of the Colorado River were doubtless the ones who captured the doctor and tried to make a meal of him. Perhaps so, said the old lady, visibly disappointed. To me, they are all alike. Indians, Mexicans, or Californians, they are all horrid. But my son Bo says that our just laws and smart lawyers will soon freeze them out that as soon as we take their lands from them, they will never be heard of any more, and then the Americans, with God's help, will have all the land that was so righteously acquired through a just war and a most liberal payment in money. Ain't that patriotism and Christian faith for you, added Mr. Hackwell. For yourself, since it comes from one of the 